Christianity offers no solution to the second death. No worries, mate. God has the solution to all death. God is at peace with the world. He is at peace with you. How can this be? Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was entombed. Jesus was roused the third day. I want to encourage you with one of the greatest verses, if not the greatest verse, in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 28 tells us, Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, Christ, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him, God, who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. This verse is the picture on the puzzle box. It reveals what the completed puzzle will look like when Jesus finally puts all of the pieces of God's plan together perfectly. Christ Jesus completes his task as mediator in bringing all mankind to God. When God is all in someone, that someone will be bursting with life, with not even a hint of death. Thus, when God is all in all, there will not be a hint of death remaining in his entire creation. Christianity teaches that most people, probably billions of people, will either remain dead in the second death forever, which is called annihilationism, or those billions of people will be tormented alive forever in the second death. This false teaching is called eternal conscious torment. Neither of these two false teachings has a solution to the second death. Thus, according to these two false teachings, God cannot be all in all. Who are you going to believe? A bunch of people with seminary degrees that deny the full scope of Jesus' successful work on the cross, or the scriptures that unashamedly and loudly proclaim his successful work in completing all of his God-given missions. Here are a couple of key puzzle pieces. These are vital corner pieces to the puzzle that frame and reveal Jesus' completed work. 1 Corinthians 15.22 tells us very clearly, for even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Here we see God in his scriptures using Adam to give us the scope of all mankind in comparison to those who will be vivified in Christ, all mankind. So we see the scope clearly revealed here in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. The word vivified in this verse means given life beyond the reach of death made immortal. This will be the case for all of mankind because of the work of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 26 tells us the last enemy is being abolished, death. Here's where Christianity really tries to feed us a line of um, very low calorie stuff. They teach that the last enemy that is abolished is the first death, not the second. So when Christianity teaches that the last enemy is destroyed, they're actually talking about the first death. So they say that the dying events, when people actually die, that will cease. But they leave billions of people in the second death forever. And get this. Oh my God. They teach that this is Jesus' successful victory over death, leaving billions of people in the second death forever. So, what is the solution, God's solution, to the second death for those who are dead in it? Resurrection. Let's take a look at a tremendous passage where Jesus teaches us about resurrection. We're going to take a look at a mashup of Matthew 22, 23 through 33, and Luke 20, 27 through 39. Now this passage can also be found in Mark 12, 18 through 27, but it is exactly the same as Matthew 22. 
Now approaching, some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, inquire of Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses writes to us, If anyone's brother should be dying and having a wife, this one should be dying childless, that his brother may be getting the wife and should be raising up seed to his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers then, and the first, getting a wife, died childless, and having no seed, he leaves his wife to his brother. And the second got the wife, and this one died childless, and the third got her. Now similarly, the seven also left no children and they died. Now subsequently to all the woman also died. The woman in the resurrection then of which of them is she becoming the wife? For the seven have had her as wife. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection and they were trying to trip Jesus up here with this question. The Sadducees also did not believe in angels or spirits. They were pretty much rationalists and liberals. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible that were written by Moses. So Moses was their guy. And if it wasn't in the first five books of the Bible, they didn't believe it. But Jesus is going to show them that even through Moses, resurrection is revealed. So in this example, they're referring back to the law of Moses that said if a man died childless, that the brother of that man would go into the dead man's wife and raise up seed to his brother so that that offspring would actually be the dead brother's child according to the law to keep the dead brother's name going. Continuing on, we see Jesus' response. Now answering, Jesus said to them, you are deceived, not being acquainted with the scriptures, nor yet with the power of God. And answering, Jesus Jesus said to them, The sons of this eon are marrying and are taken out in marriage, yet those deemed worthy to happen upon that eon and the resurrection from among the dead are neither marrying nor taking out in marriage, but are as the messengers of God in heaven. For neither can they still be dying, for they are equal to the messengers and are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So Jesus gives the verbal smackdown to these Sadducees in Matthew 22:29. He says to them, "You are deceived, not being acquainted with the scriptures, nor yet with the power of God." My goodness, how would you like to say that? To, maybe you've said that to people before. I've used it in some of my writings before, but I don't know that I've ever had a chance to say that to somebody. But it's kind of funny that he was so direct with them, telling them that they were deceived, didn't understand the scriptures and the power of God. That is a spiritual smackdown. So Jesus goes on and continues to speak to them. The sons of this eon are marrying and are taken out in marriage, yet those deemed worthy to happen upon that eon and the resurrection from among the dead are neither marrying nor taking out in marriage, but are as messengers of God in heaven. So he's talking about this current eon, which is the current wicked eon, people are marrying. But those that are deemed worthy to happen upon that eon, that eon being the next eon, which is not the wicked eon, is the eon that includes the millennial reign of Christ on earth earth with his saints, in that resurrection there will be no marrying for those that are resurrected. And Jesus goes on to tell them, For neither can they be dying, for they are equal to messengers and are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So this is the class of people that are vivified or made immortal at the return of Christ, at the end of this current wicked eon before the next eon that contains the millennium. Now let's move on to the final page here, page 3 of this mashup of Matthew 22 and Luke 20. This is Jesus continuing to speak here to the Sadducees that did not believe believe in resurrection. Now that the dead are rousing, did you not read that which is declared to you by God, and even Moses divulges, which means to tell a supposed secret, at the thorn bush, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now God is he not of the dead, but of the living, for all to him are living. Man, there is so much just in this little bit right here. First, I want us to look at where Jesus says, now that the dead are rousing, well, that leads us to the question, what dead? Which dead are rousing? Well, on the previous page, we looked at those that are being raised and vivified when Christ returns, and they will be living through the next two eons, the eon with the millennium and the eon with the new heaven and new earth. They will have eonian life. So which dead are rousing? Jesus tells us very clearly, all to him are living. All people to God are living. How can all be living to him? And we see where it says, now God is he not of the dead, but of the living. So this sounds very confusing. 
So Jesus has already told us that the dead are rousing, all of the dead, because to God all are living, but he is not the God of the dead. How can all be living to him? That is a great question. I want to go to another slide quickly to reveal the answer as to how all can be living to God. Isaiah 57 15 gives us the solution to the dilemma. This is God speaking. For thus says the one high and lifted up, who tabernacles the future, and holy is his name. This is how to God everyone is living, because he's already in the future. He is already at that time when he will be all in all. He is already at that time when the second death will be emptied by resurrection. God is all ready there. That's why he can be said to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and say it in the present tense because all time is present to God. He is not limited by time as we are. He is the one who tabernacles the future. Back to our mashup on page three, we can see that the dead are rousing all of the dead. For this is the critical point. For all to him are living. That is the only way that God can be all in all if all are living. And this is exactly what happens when those in the second death are vivified and resurrected to immortality. So there's a, a few things I want to touch on that could be questions in your mind. Uh, there were questions in my mind. From our vantage point right now, God is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from our viewpoint because they are dead and he is not the God of the dead. So while anyone is dead, he is not their God. Whether they're a believer, whether they're an unbeliever, that does not matter. He is not the God of the dead, any dead. And it's important to note in the previous slides that Jesus was talking at first about the resurrection of those who are vivified when he returns to the earth. And that is the second class of people that 1 Corinthians 15 talks about, those that are vivified in his presence. And after that, in which was on the third slide page, then he expands it to all people. All are alive to God. So, I want us to not get confused there and think that the resurrection is just limited to those that will be resurrected for the next eon when the immortals will not be dying and they will not be marrying. So Jesus starts small with the first group and then he expands it to all of humanity. And I think it's very important for us to understand through this passage that we just looked at that Jesus is not saying that there is life and death because... To God, all are living. That is not what he's saying. What Jesus is saying, that all will be living because the dead are resurrected. And that is future. God is already there. So this passage actually teaches that the dead are literally dead because God is not their God. If they were alive somewhere else in God's creation in a different zip code, the living dead, he would be their God. And then none of this that Jesus said would make sense. So this is proof one of several proofs throughout the scriptures that dead people are actually dead and not alive somewhere. They are the dead dead, not the living dead. Because if God was the God of the living dead, that would mean that he is the God of the dead, which Jesus said he is not. So that contradicts the clear statement of Jesus. And just what I think is kind of a funny true story, my five-year-old grandson, I pick him up at school most days and he's very fast he's a very fast runner and he likes to watch sonic movies and sonic cartoons sonic the hedgehog they had a video game about him years ago and he he's still alive and well so young kids are still watching him but one day after i picked my grandson up we were talking about speed and everything he's always fascinated with speed since he's fast he said uh, grandpa who's faster sonic or god and i said well god is and Sonic has been clocked in some of the movies by the police at 300 miles an hour. So Sonic is fast, but God's faster. So I told my grandson, I said, if God and Sonic raced to the next town from here, when Sonic got there, God would already be there because he's already there. He's in the future. He is everywhere in space and in time. That is God. And my grandson he was amazed at that thought. He didn't ask me any more questions for a while. I think he just was pondering that because that's a big idea that we really can't grasp. We can believe it, but to really understand the mechanics of it, you can't, so don't even try. All right, let's wrap this up with some simple closing points. One, 
God will be all in all because of the successful, completed work of his son. Two, God is not the God of the dead. Three, for God to be all in all, there can be none left in the state of death, meaning the second death. And four, when Christ has successfully done his work, there will not be a hint or a whiff of death in all of God's creation.